Hello, everybody. Thank you, Julie. Um, it's great to see you and people in the room. I really appreciate you coming to read and to listen. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land that we're on, the Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, this place where we tell stories and share knowledge, as has happened in this place for a very long time. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend my respect to the people of the lands of those joining us from beyond the campus. My name is Belinda Castles. I'm a novelist and a teacher of writing. And <laughs> I'm just getting used to the, the mask business. Um, and I coordinate the creative writing program here at Sydney. Our program runs from first year to third year in the undergraduate program. So if you're just joining the university, and this is people will be watching this later as well, please feel very welcome to enrol in the first year unit where we look at all kinds of writing examples, try different kinds of writing and approaches to writing. Our students are not just English majors, they come from all over the university and of course from all over the world. We also run a large postgraduate program with students enrolled in graduate certificate and graduate diploma and the Masters of Creative Writing. We also have a number of research students enrolled in the D Arts and PhD degrees and our wonderful tutor, Julie McElhone, um, is one of these. Our classes are taught by creative writing staff in the English department. So that's me, Belinda. There's also Beth Yarp, Vanessa Berry, Peter Minter and Toby Fitch. And by tutors who are also published writers and our doctoral students. Creative writing classes, if you haven't been to one, are fun, challenging, and give you distinctive insights into the ways your fellow students wish to make meaning. They're also excellent training for reflecting on your own work and learning the skills you'll need in various media and education roles, including, <laughs> I think, the superpower of giving constructive feedback without breaking any hearts. Uh, we can talk and um, answer questions. And um, for those of you watching the recording, please feel free to contact me, belinda.parcels at sydney.edu.au. Um, for now, I will hand over to Julie. And I'm very proud to introduce our readers today, as well as Julie, um, who will give you a fun time. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to give you a fun time. <laughs> No pressure. Um, if you don't have a fun time during this, I'm not very interested in, in knowing that, so don't tell me. Um, only interested in hearing that you're having a good time. Thank you. Um, so first up, uh, we are going to hear our writers read their work. Um, we're going to start with Donna Lynn Shu. Um, now, because I'm a, um, a Doctor of Arts student, you would think that I'd be across everybody and who, who's here and what they're up to. No, I just sit in a little uh, studio around the corner there and I don't talk to anybody for um, months and months and months until I'm, I'm asked to do something like this. So um, I'm very interested to hear what Donalyn um, has been writing. Um, Donalyn, are you doing, um, do you do prose? Do you do poetry? What is your um, yeah, I write poetry mostly and kind of nonfiction essay prose. All right. Um, I'll hand it over to you and maybe if you just introduce to us um, what your piece is. Of course. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Hi, Bronwyn, for the first time. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge that I live on unceded Cabrigal land and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, so as I've said, I'm a poet, nonfiction essay writer sometimes editor and like day job arts worker. I just finished my honours thesis at UC in English and Art History and I took creative writing classes at both junior and senior levels a few years ago. So in my like very, very baby writing career, um, they, were, they happened at very different stages of my time. So the first one for me, I think was really about learning to be open and unafraid about sharing my work with other people. I think because I was thinking of poetry as something so like precious and personal but I was kind of learning how to hold it out to the world without losing any part of me. And the second class I took when I was a bit older was with Belinda, which is great. And it was just a very fun and exciting bridge between 
like solely writing for student publications and then trying to get published elsewhere and widely. So I had this like fierce desperation to write, like I was going to die if I didn't do it, which is still a feeling that I cherish even now. So uh, some of the poems that I want to read today, I'll read three just because they're so short. Um, two of them started brewing in these classes. The first one was published by VoiceWorks almost exactly as I had written it for Belinda's class. So there were some small and meaningful edits, but it mostly stayed in its original form. And it was the last piece I wrote for my major work assessment. And I remember just being so exhausted and like emptied of any extravagant words. So I gave myself two days to write like a Chen Chen style of poem. Um, I really enjoyed writing it. Um, and it's called Ode to Woolworths. After seeing the psychologist, I visit my local grocery store. I leave one hour of trauma behind aisles of chip packets and air. Enveloped by artificial lights, its cruel brightness is a vision of unprecedented beauty. Still life with rotting mangoes and the soft hum of our small and human lives. I'm sorting through grapefruits, feeling anonymous, while Whitney Houston plays overhead. I stand here for longer than I need to, listening to I Want to Dance with Somebody beside wild colours of citrus. Anthony says time doesn't exist in supermarkets anyway. He used to work at Aldi and doesn't miss the lack of windows, sitting in a swivel chair scanning muesli bars, the monotonous beep, beep, beep. But I'm more romantic. Maybe it's the pulse of suburban nostalgia in which everything makes you weepy. Like walking to the aisle vaguely named Asian and seeing images of childhood overpriced and carefully curated, a bricolage of culture. Maybe it's a heart monitor tracking the veins of this city. This Tuesday afternoon, the baby crying in its pram like I am crying by the instant curry. Maybe it's just white noise, the synth beat of a Whitney song. The exhale that says, I'm here. It's fine. Everything goes. The next poem I wanted to read is actually a commission by one of the editors of VoiceWorks. Um, so it was for the Tell Me Like You Mean It anthology by Cordite and Australian Poetry. And uh, I wanted to read this poem because I actually like kind of Frankenstein merged some lines from earlier drafts of poems I wrote for both of the creative writing classes. So some of the, um, I think one image is like years old. And I think if I think of Ode to Worths as kind of like um, the ideal, I wrote a whole poem for class, got it published exactly as is, then this one could be kind of another way to think of how to make use of what you write and things that stay with you for years and just come to you when you need them. So this poem is called Out of Solace. We marked June with sympathy flowers left on a doorstep, obnoxiously yellow and innocent, followed by the usual surrender. It was not language, but its inverse cradled between us. Small, small words of comfort, scattered like breadcrumbs fed to lost pigeons before flight. I'm sorry, I never get the words right the first time. Every day I workshop a list of what I love most or what is within reach though they are not always the same. Some things are easy enough. The scent of camphor on a winter morning under the sun, the sun, a fine silk glove draped over my hands. My initial response to touch, which is to scrutinize. How loneliness diffuses my need to be alone. And even this is too close. Someone on the internet says the catharsis of tragedy is our own suffering fed back to us. So I replay old movies and search for a pain that is familiar. I cut my hair in the bathroom with my eyes averted from the mirror, distracted by the threads unspooling at my bare feet, pieces of myself I could discard or collect. I admit it was embarrassing to want to live so badly. I was embarrassed. The petals lifted to the wind. I turned my face away in silence. I had nothing to say after all. I was the only one still growing older. The last poem that I'll read did not start in these classes, but it's the longest one that I have and I needed to make up the reading time. Um, 
Uh, this one was also published in VoiceWorks for a different edition, and it's one that was heavily edited. It was a very different writing experience for me, I think, because I wasn't as attached to it. And it's a meta poem, which is like a poem about poems. So like I remember for Ode to Woolworths, I rejected some of my editor's suggestions. But for this poem, I was very happy for it to kind of be what it needed to be. I felt like a good impersonal distance from it, which meant it became something that formally and conceptually I found great joy in. So this poem is called Dream Translation. The speaker of my poems manufactures joy with radiance, organic feelings bubbling over. The way verb pumiced into metaphor is a relational spill dissolved into sweetness. The speaker always holds the mandarin in the hollow cusp of her palm before she eats. This too is a sweetness that lives on the skin, an effervescent bodily practice she is helplessly devoted to. She pledges allegiance to all tender fruits, anything that wilts and propagates syrup, blooming endlessly like most desires. The first time she eats an orange in the shower, she lets the juice run down her chin and licks the angular slope of her wrist, enamored with the sticky hairs on her forearm, tasting salt brine and zest and forgiveness. Rain petals on Valencia flesh, honeyed nectar fragrance simmering everywhere, a blood rush pink, pried open without rot. The heavy scent of orange peel in the steaming air is the only memory that stays. In the poem, she unsalts every wound she ever inflicted on her body. Like a child who recoils from violence, she wants to know what hands are capable of. She ornaments nakedness, dresses herself clean again, says, Trust me, it's more romantic to segment affection and bite into it. Isn't every ode to beauty an elegy first? And what else can this body digest if not emptiness? I won't pretend I want to be unsayable. I want to ripen a language made easy to swallow. Peel the bitter rind with my fingers, in the shower, in the dream, in the city of adornment. Wash, open, and exhume a fizzled heart beneath a weeping faucet. Not the sweetness that I crave, but the hunger. Thank you. Annalyn, um, beautiful. Just give me a moment while I coordinate coming back here. Um, hello, that's me arriving and you Leaving. Beautiful. Um, yeah, lovely. I love the idea of that works, works brewing away, but I think you've done more than just brew those works. They're beautiful, very well crafted. And um, yes, the exhale, um, the exhale that says, I'm fine. It's okay. Is that something? Is that what you said? Something like that. Beautiful. So our next reader um, is, just hold on a moment. Now, Grace, is that you? Um, is that you there? Yeah, sorry. I, I had you down as Duluan. Oh, yeah, that's my last name, yeah. Name. I go by both. So, uh, so Grace, uh, Ugame? Ugame? Ugame. Ugame, beautiful. Um, Grace, I'm going to pass to you just maybe a little, um, a few words about where you are, what you're doing. Um, uh, introduce yourself to us. Um, that would be great. And I'm going to just bring you up. Okay. Hey, move you around like I am a god. Hold on. There you go. On that giant screen, oh god, it's like I can see myself. Um, <laughs> no. It's okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Grace. Um, I'm doing my master's of creative writing um, part time. Um, so I'm doing it pretty slowly. I'm in my fourth semester. Um, I, um, you know, was working full time, various jobs before I decided to um, do this Masters of Creative Writing. And so I thought I would choose some pieces um, that kind of, they're not really polished and they're a little bit, they're, you know, but they're emblematic, I guess, of kind of what the Masters of Creative Writing has kind of meant for me, which is kind of provide this interesting structure 
in which I could kind of develop a discipline of writing and develop a kind of a practice. Um, so the first piece um, that I'm going to read, I don't know how much of it is I'm going to read, but it was um, came out of the life writing workshop, which was the first workshop workshop that I did with Anwen Crawford. Um, and it was a prompt that she gave us in one of the first weeks, which was um, write down a story um, you repeatedly tell. And I think that I wrote this really quickly. She maybe gave us 10 minutes, turned off my Zoom and just wrote it out. And I think it was one of the kind of first pieces where I thought, um, yeah, it was something kind of came to me intuitively. Um, and it's not super polished, but I think it was one of the first pieces where I began to think about um, like the usefulness of constraints and accountability and of writing exercises because previous to that I hadn't uh, really set them for myself. So um, here it is. A story I repeatedly tell is how I came to be with Joe. It was a time of my life where I had given up the project of conformity and decided to choose for myself the rules that I would follow. Until then, I had more or less teetered between obedience and divergence. We were in South America, the both of us, waiting for adulthood to begin. I had planned to be there for a year, he for three months. Neither of these sketches solidified into reality. There was a bonfire the night he arrived. Both of us huddled around it, speaking in Spanish to accommodate the Frenchies, as we called them then, whose English was limited either by their disdain for its supremacy or their lack of faculty with it. We became friends, he and I, and I didn't anticipate anything more. I had shaved my head rather dramatically and run away to Bolivia without hope or desire of pairing off in any way with anyone. Everything in that first month happened in groups, road trips, nights out, lounging in houses, a Canadian Thanksgiving. Still, nothing happened between us that was not platonic. It's hard to say what changed. Certain illusions I held allowed me to explore the possibility of him. Or maybe it was the temporality of my, our existence overseas. We were, in our own ways, only passing through on the way to future milestones. Um, so I might stop there. It goes for maybe another 100 words or so, but it kind of I guess gives you an idea of if I was, you know, writing prose, um, life writing, um, and it was, you know, a story that I repeatedly tell, but um, I was forced to kind of tell it in writing. Um, but um, the kind of, I'm going to read like two, maybe two more, two poems that I'm kind of writing at the moment. Um, and um, these are for uh, my, my creative work for my dissertation, which I'm doing with Beth Yap. Um, and it's kind of, um, I guess, a development of this idea of exploring the intimacy of our relationship between my partner and I, my partner who's American, um, but kind of um, through the Masters of Creative Writing and over time, I wrote, you know, that piece in my first semester. And now I'm in my fourth and I, I think in my second semester, I kind of um, came to poetry and that really changed a lot, a, a lot for me. And I think um, I started writing poetry and it was just this really animating force and um, really changed the way that I wrote and thought. And that was really unexpected because I think I'd come to the masters thinking that I would write short stories or essays or, you know, something more prosy. Um, so some of these pieces, um, uh, they're very much in the work. Some of them don't have titles. So I'll read, but I'll just preface it by saying it's uh, in the context of thinking about int intimacy, um, relationality, and also, I guess, the histories about um, different countries, my partner and, and I. Okay, let's just take a sip of water. <laughs> Where do I end and this nation begin? Where do I end and he begins? Where do we end and we begin? Draw the boundary between us. At its border, plant rows of flowers, so I know that at this severing, seeds, roots, roots, buds, petals, scents, carried on the wind. Too sentimental? Then imagine what we know a border to be. Um, this one is called Vows Rewritten. I take you and I take you and I take you. It's striking, you're striking, I am struck, what strikes me? I'm not trying to reconcile a nation with a nation, but our bodies 
together, this love work, this heart sweat, this you, I, a labor of us. See how history is an interruption. Um, and I think I might just read the last one. Okay, this one's also untitled, just they're all in the works. Um, okay. I obey these words, ruined roots, ruinous rooted roots, ruins. I am unruly, unruled, lineless. I do not cue, cannot perform on cue, nor spell it, a skewered cuteness, acute pain, acute suffering. The interior lands of me are hard to traverse. Resist being made subject. Stifle like rifle, gender like genre, a muck, a ruckus. So come, succumb, up here, appear, give up, give it up, give yourself up. Speaking, I leave my sentences hanging. Don't you know how the mind works? Separate from the mouth, words form, leap, frog over tongue, skip, throat go straight to not knowing. I'm trying to put this in a language you'll understand. I've tried to speak from a different eye, but I can't put my shoes in somebody else's feet, can't walk a feet in somebody else's mile. The turns have tabled you stupid idiom. I can't find my way around this language. Thank you, that's all. So good, They're, they are in uh, better shape than you think that they are in. I think you <laughs> might be being quite humble there. Um, beautiful, beautiful. Um, poetry. I wish you guys were all here and so we could all go for coffee afterwards and talk about this. Um, and also I'm taking down everybody's exercises um, to steal them for um, my own classes. So thank you. Keep, keep those coming. Um, Bastian, are you, um, there you go, Bastian. Hey. <laughs> um, are you ready to go? Would you like to just give us a little intro to yourself and then? Yeah. In there and I'll I'm ready. <laughs> I'll um, get myself out of the way and um, hi how are you <laughs> we know how you are the people the people who didn't arrive earlier uh, wouldn't have got this the side profile <laughs> oh yeah I'm very going to have a baby in a couple of days <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> you can't tell from from here up <laughs> cool so my name is Bastian Fox Phelan and I did a Master of Arts by Research at Sydney Uni, um, graduating in 2018, and uh, Beth Yap was my supervisor. Um, the reason I enrolled in the Master of Arts by Research is I was writing a, a book and um, I'd written the first like 15,000 words, but I felt that I needed um, a mentor and a bit of structure and uh, so I thought that doing this program would give me give me that and um, I had met Beth through a private masterclass that she was running at the time and actually I also met um, Bronwyn um, at that masterclass so yeah we were we were writing buddies in a writing group for a while together um, yeah, so I kind of wrote like the middle section of my book as my research um, major work. And uh, then I continued writing after I graduated and finally finished the book kind of end of last year. And it's going to be published in May of this year, which is super exciting. It's called How to Be Between and it's coming out um, through Giramondo which is an amazing um, publisher based in Sydney. And my book is about my experience of polycystic ovarian syndrome and facial hair and navigating gender identity. And I guess uh, learning to accept fluidity as one's nature. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna read to you, uh, I'm gonna read you the very beginning of the book, which um, I wrote more recently. I think I wrote it partway through last year. <laughs> um, yeah, if you like the book, you can 
it'll probably be available to pre-order on Giramondo's website in a few weeks time. Okay. Picture me at 26. It's 2014 and my hair is short and fawn colored. I'm growing it out from when I shaved it. I wear glasses. I have a light beard and mustache. I wear my clothes loose over a small frame. I'm more boyish than I've ever been, although I don't care about that as much these days. I've grown tired of thinking about how to put together an outfit that will pass, how to speak low, how to walk manly, how to accentuate the hairs that have grown unaided across my lower face for half my life. I refer to the small bumps beneath my t-shirt as my chest. And if you peered inside me with an ultrasonic frequency, you'd see that my ovaries are adorned with dark circles like a string of black pearls. This doesn't bother me. My period comes once a month now, like it never used to, and I don't mind. I'm beginning to see how it's possible for many things to be true at once. I live with the kind of body that ovulates with breasts and the rest and facial hair that some say shouldn't be there and a slippery kind of gender identity that I haven't quite pinned down yet. I've been living in Sydney for almost four years. Over, um, over time, it seems that the closer I look at my body and my gender, the blurrier its edges become. At first, I was one thing, a girl thing. Then at 22, I announced to the world that I was, in fact, a boy thing. Lately, though, I have not been so sure. Right now, I have other things on my mind. I'm in the garage underneath my family home on the south coast of New South Wales, confronting an old filing cabinet. It's four deep bellied drawers filled with paper. I have the bad habit of not letting things go. The filing cabinet is almost as tall as I am. Its beige metal surface is covered in magnets and stickers of indie record labels, vegan slogans, a zine shop, the Greenpeace logo, I'm standing on the dusty concrete floor with the garage door open. Outside, the clear tone of bellbirds echoes through the eucalyptus trees that grow from the back of the house to the top of the escarpment. On the morning breeze is the smell of salt water and seaweed. I know I'd rather be walking Jonah, my family's Labrador, down the gravel path beside the train line, under the Morton Bay fig trees in Glastonbury Gardens, and across the road to the dog beach. But mum has asked me to sort through my stuff. I'm in the belly of the whale and I'm scared. The past is a dangerous place. Every few years I get an itch. When my skin begins to feel tight and my life begins to feel small, I shed. Objects, cities, friends, identities. There are pieces of me scattered all over, many of which I have not come back for. For the past two years, I've been living in a terrace house in Petersham, but in a few months time, I'll be moving overseas. My bedroom will empty out, clothes taken to charity bins, books given to friends, posters on the wall taken down and pasted into scrapbooks. I seem to find pleasure in abandoning the most recent past, the life I've built myself, the person I've become. The problem is I'm sentimental. I've never been willing to scorch the earth behind me when I leave. There are some things I put in boxes. I save these things for later, whenever that is. Unburdening myself makes it easier to run. When I was a child, my uncle watched me playing in the park and said, she's a runner. I remember on the cusp of puberty, competing in the 100 meter sprint at the school sports carnival. I was a soccer playing tomboy. I had strong legs. I ran hard, feet pounding the buffalo grass. I wanted to win. In the last few seconds, I sensed an incredible source of energy inside me an electrical tingle, a surge of power that would catapult me forwards at light speed. But for some reason, I couldn't tap into it. I always fell short at the finish line. By high school, I had given up on the whole idea of physical activity. My body was becoming an unwelcome place. As the strength of the childhood prophecy wore off, a new one came to take its place, a darker prophecy, one that would mark me as different other. The prophet, my hormones. Speaking through me, they began to reveal my destiny, the ways in which I would complicate ideas about gender, 
just by existing. How I would come to present with apparent femaleness as one who should be a woman, and yet with a beard that would forbid people to read me as such. And so the hair began to grow. The hair was like a question mark upon my face. Everywhere I went, people demanded to know, what are you? I said I was a girl thing, but in truth, I've never been this. Not completely, not easily, not freely. My passage through the world as girl, then woman, has been blocked, questioned, challenged. People have asked for my passport, for proof. They have reached out a hand to pull on my beard to see if it is real. Unlike my 19th century counterparts, Madame Clifulia, Annie Jones, Julia Pastrana, I am no bearded lady. I have no genteel manners. I will not perform, I will not permit transgressions. I do not exist to satisfy public curiosity, an abject object on display. I'm not here to embody the abnormal so others can gaze upon me and feel that they themselves are happily normal. You may have questions about my beard. Why, how, when? You may wanna see a picture, confirm that it exists. Sometimes it is not visible. Sometimes I play the circus magician and I make the hair disappear. It's not really gone though. The disappearance is a temporary illusion and the hair returns to center stage in time. I assure you, my beard is real and it has a story, but this is the least interesting thing about me. Yet it is the thing I must explain, not just to others, but to myself. And so I go in search of an answer to that question, the one that everyone should ask themselves, but few do. What are you? We shall see, you and I. We will investigate together like a pair of detectives, and we will try at least to piece together a reasonable account of how I searched. We will look for answers in the paper trail, these records of my younger self. I hope that you will accept this assemblage, this collation of documents, in lieu of a definitive answer if one cannot be found. It begins here with me climbing inside the towering filing cabinet. <laughs> Wow, Bastian. Wow, wow. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Amazing. I just went online to see if I can find a, a link to your <laughs> book yet. <laughs> I think it's maybe not up on the website just yet. But no, no, it's not there. I, I did, um, I have followed you on Twitter, so I'll be, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, um, I'll send out all those retweets when it comes out. It's really terrific and all the best for, for its um, publication in May, you say? Yeah, in May. <laughs> terrific. Terrific, terrific, wonderful. All right, thank you. Thank you. Special. Um, now we have Kate Vanderbrook, who is actually here in person. So she is also sort of a hybrid um, for us. Um, so if everybody could, um, uh, you know, stay around, of course, online, and um, Kate's going to join in um, to the screen here. I'm going to move that way. She's going to move in and then tell us a little bit about herself. Um, so here comes Kate. Hi everyone. Um, I've just finished the Masters in Creative Writing and I think some of you behind me and in front of me um, will have encountered me on that journey. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I would read for you, um, actually I thought I would tell you what I found really useful about the Masters in Creative Writing. So obviously um, a couple of people have mentioned the discipline and, and the structure around forcing you to just nail your bum to a seat and just write. Um, and that um, was something that I did anticipate. But what I didn't anticipate was that it was like belonging to the best book club because you got referred um, or, in fact, forced to read um, fabulous writing, um, published writing from everywhere that I probably wouldn't have picked up if left to my own devices. And I'm really glad that um, I got exposure to that. That was a phenomenal kind of 
um, benefit, I think, of the course. Um, and the other one was um, forcing me to be a much better editor um, and really look at my own writing, um, which is done through a process of looking at other people's writing and thinking, well, you know, you've started your story in chapter five. Um, why did you do that? Let's look at how, how you can delete everything else that's extraneous, um, which I'm a great, um, I suppose, uh, proponent of. I, I'm, I do that all the time, start my story in chapter five. Um, something else that people know about me is that I'm obsessed by archive. And um, so I spent a lot of time during hard lockdown with my nose in archives and I found them to be fantastic writing prompts. Um, so I'll just hold this up for you. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, um, it's reversed. Um, <laughs> but that's what it looks like. It's from the New South Wales um, Police Gazette and which is basically how they caught criminals in 1900. So this is from July, 1900. Um, and it got me thinking, um, you know, without, DNA and modern forensics and the internet, how did they keep track of people who were um, fraudsters? Um, so I came across the idea of a female fraudster who, um, and I told her story through her victims or, or the people that she impacted. Um, so the title of this particular um, article from the New South Wales Police Gazette was Offences Not Otherwise Described. Um, which I thought, fantastic. You know, that just leaves you so many um, things to talk about. <laughs> There's no offence that could not otherwise be described. Um, so this is a victim report of a tram conductor. Um, Randwick Station, October 1901, relative to young woman, good looking, commit fraud. First off, I wanted on the record, this is humiliating. I don't want to be here. Let me make clear this whole embarrassing matter was only an act of kindness. I never had no funny ideas about her, I swear. It's just, well, like I said, Constable, when I first come in, we sold our furniture for the deposit I gave her. We really need our money back, we're desperate. Else I wouldn't be telling no one this story, no way, no how. My name is Andrew Rowlings and I'm a conductor on the trams. 15 years I've been employed right through the 90s depression which not many can boast of. I first came across her on the tram, of course. It was the end of the line at Coogee Pleasure Pier. Everyone else alighted, but she didn't move. We only had the 10 minute break before we had to turn it round and be back into the city. Finally, I said, end of the line, miss. And she gave me a funny look and said, yes, it is really, I suppose, isn't it? Don't misunderstand me. She's a respectable looking lady and very nicely spoken with that posh accent of hers. I said to her, don't you want to get out? Pier is the place to be on a sunny Sunday. Look at all them folk consuming every amusement their hearts could desire. That's the problem, she said. My heart, is it a medical problem? I asked. She was sitting there unmoving. I feared I might need the ambulance. She didn't need no encouragement to let it all spill out. I heard the first part in the 10 minute break, but then the tram started to fill when I had to sell tickets. So many trying for a free ride on that route. I told her my break was coming up and I would hear the rest of her account once we got past Randwick Junction. In a nutshell, officer, she laid on me a very convincing story about being from a posh family in England, emigrated out here on the promise of marriage to a clergyman, then jilted at the altar. Shocking thing. Her family, she said, was wealthy. Their agent had wired 5,000 pounds living expenses for her, expecting there to be wedding costs and a husband at this point. But as it turned out, the bank wouldn't release such a large sum to a single woman. She was just about out of money, had paid the last to her boarding house and was all at a loss as to where she should go. Her eyes were so very big and green, officer, and there were genuine tears in them. She said, I don't know what to do. Then and there, I offered her the only cash I had on me to buy another night's accommodation. And that's not like me at all, but she refused it. That's what made me trust her, refusing the money, plus those big green eyes with the tears. And she had this manner about her constable. It's very difficult to put into words, reminded me of a country school teacher. She looked extremely respectable, dressed very fine, neat and tidy. Nothing about her appearance gave me pause. I tried to get her a dress. 
but instead she gave me directions for a shop where she said I could leave a message for her. I didn't intend nothing improper, officer, but you understand. I wanted to be able to check in on her, make sure she's taken care of, a single young lady, alone and friendless in a foreign country. The thought of it stayed with me. And when I got home, I still couldn't shake her. I even mentioned her to Tilly, that's my wife, when she asked me why I was so distracted. To make it seem more respectable like, I told Tilly that she was an older lady. It was Tilly who had the idea. Get her family to direct the money into our bank, she suggested, then we can withdraw it and give it to her. We had the consideration that maybe, seeing as her family was so rich, they wouldn't mind paying us a little commission for our trouble. That's how it happened, quick as that. Next day, I went round to leave her a message at the little shop in Randwick. Thought it best to leave her my contact details at the works depot. You know how it is, officer. Some matters best dealt with at work and no mixing it with home life, even though it was Tilly's idea after all. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't like you're thinking, I swear. Before the end of the day, I had a note back to meet her in the grounds at St Jude's Church at five o'clock. Odd place to meet, I thought. But then who knows what posh people from England like to get up to or the places they go. Long story short, that second meeting with her left me with an even more favourable expression. Hard to explain, but something in the way she held her spine real upright, and I already said about the eyes, didn't I? My wife and I have been married 15 years, and she's a good woman, but you're a man of the world, officer. This young lady had something about her that meant any man sitting next to her on a park bench couldn't think straight. I related Tilly's idea for getting her money wired into her, our account, and she was so grateful she wept. Most women don't come over all pretty when they cry, but this one did. I got a bit emotional too. Then she asked me to do her the greatest favour in the world and call her Nellie on the grounds that I was now the very dearest friend she had in the universe. I felt right proud I'd been the means of making someone so happy. Someone, any man, would be proud to be seen with. She put her hand on my arm and asked me if it wouldn't be improper, if she might beg a favour, I don't mind admitting my heart beat a little faster. All manner of notions swirled around my brain at what she might offer next. She proposed telegramming her family in England, begging for them to pay me for the trouble of receiving her 5,000 pounds and asking them to repay double any amount I might advance on her. There was a small matter of her immediate expenses to do with food and lodgings. <clears throat> she said then, and such a gentle voice she has officer, she wouldn't like to inconvenience me in the slightest, but it was only that she was so very desperate and perhaps I shouldn't proceed if it might cause a rift between myself and my wife. I got home late that night. My dinner was cold and Tilly was wearing a sour expression. I told her I met with the old lady and her proposal doub doubling any monies advanced to her. Tilly came over all thoughtful at this. She was the one who had the idea of selling our furniture. Her brother's friend had us a pawn shop. He'd give us a good price and hold our pieces for a week. That would be enough time for us to double any money advanced. Then we could buy our furniture back and reap a handsome profit. Maybe enough for a holiday. No stopping Tilly once she has a notion and the very next day the assessor came round with his truck. When I got home, the house was bare. Tilly handed me 405 pounds and told me, give it her. I see your face. No need to say anything out loud. You know the rest officer. I gave Nellie the cash. She was that grateful and the manner's very pleasing with it. We arranged to meet the following day to settle the particulars of the bank transfer. She suggested the parlor room at the Royal Hotel. I sat there, a right idiot like, for two full hours. I realized she would never turn up, but I was putting off going home to Tilly and confessing all. Nothing you could say right now would be worse than the scorn unleashed upon me by my wife that night. Three sets of neighbours came pounding on the door when they heard her scream. I'm black and blue from the blows she rained down on me, Constable, as I told you. We went straight to the shop in Randwick, but they told me they hadn't seen Nellie for two days and doubted they ever would again. Thank you. So it wasn't me, it wasn't me. Um, fantastic, great. That was rollicking, Kate, thank you. <laughs> Um, right, well, next on the, the thing, it says um, Julie McElhone is going to give you a run of workshop. But I wonder, does everybody, I might get everybody's face up here. Does everybody want a little break? How are we going? Do a little five minute break? Bastian, how are you feeling? 
Actually, you're the one we should be asking. How are you feeling? Uh, Right. I, might I might head off in a minute, but um, thanks so much for having me and for the reading. So really, really enjoyable. All right. Thank you, and and good luck on your on your um, on your book. Thank um, you. Right. right now, listen, everybody. I think we might, if you wouldn't mind, just take a five minute, and then I can get myself all organised, and um, we'll be back at. Um, Let's do it back at, at three. We're running a bit behind, but um, I'll keep mine very short and I will, I'll try and make up some time. So back here at three. Okay. Recording now. All right, welcome back. Um, we've just had a little break. Um, it's a lovely sunny day here on campus and it's buzzing. So when you finally come back in here, it's very exciting after a very depressed couple of months, I have to say. Um, I, I managed it stoically. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But really, it was, now that I see that it wasn't fine, it turns out. The next reader is um, actually a friend of mine. We started uh, doing our masters together in um, two, uh, two, 2017, uh, graduated 2018. Um, and then she moved on to do her um, Doctor of Arts. And I said, that's a good idea, I'll do the same. So I'm, I'm about uh, six months behind her and um, so I'll bring Annette up to the um, screen now. I'll be sliding this way and she'll be telling you a little bit about herself and then reading some of her work. So please welcome Annette Freeman. Uh, Annette Higgs, my apologies. Hello, thank you Julie. Thank you Julie. It's been five fun years. <laughs> um, when I was asked to do this we were also asked um, to just Bring up a few things that uh, we might want to convey about the experience of doing creative writing at Sydney for people who are just beginning and I'd like to I, I just picked a two or three things to mention but one of the very first ones echoes what Kate said the reading lists you're going to be given are marvelously curated things um, by people who know what they're talking about don't skip them <laughs> they're very um, precious and wonderful um, you will find all kinds of things from reading those um, that will just broaden your horizons. Um, the other thing, of course, is the, the, the terrific um, skills you'll acquire in workshopping, which is, uh, as I think Kate also said, really helps you with your own editing your own work. Um, in my particular case, I lucked out and uh, a group from one of my workshopping classes got together um, off piste and formed a writers group, which is still going. All these years later and still very active and very useful so um, we use the exact same skills we learned in those first workshopping uh, classes which is great um, and the final point I wanted to, to just mention is when you get to your uh, dissertation or um, in the case of the D arts the whole thing when you hear the terms practice-led research don't freak out it's actually although mysterious <laughs> a marvelous thing when you dive in and get to grips with it. And the most marvelous thing for me that I found out, but I'm sure it'll, it's different for everyone. But the main thing I found was the way it opens you to change, to change the idea you began with, to explore all kinds of byways and come up with something you had no idea you could come up with to begin with. And that leads in a little bit to the thing I'm going to read, which is straight out of the middle of the novel I wrote for my D arts. And this is going to take you to the 1870s, to the back blocks of Tasmania, 
on a hard scrabble farm <laughs> where it's been a hard, hard winter. And I know that this is very different to many of the readings we've heard today. Um, and it may seem far less personal than some of the readings we've heard today. But in fact, what I found, <laughs> and it was a long road and many, many changes to write this piece of work. But what I found was it's actually, although 150 years ago, very, very personal for me. So that was, it was, it was a, a very intense discovery, which you may not get from reading this, but I will when I read it to you. So here we go. It rained for weeks, dampening Jack's spirits. He hadn't predicted this much rain and the deluge cut the family off from neighbors and slowed their work. At first, his father had greeted the rain as a blessing for the wheat crop, but as it went on and on, he called it a curse. When a break in the weather finally came, Jack and Eddie took their little brother Amos and went out rabbiting. The family hadn't had meat for days apart from a bit of bacon. What's more, the boys could get threepence a pair for the rabbit skins if they took them into town on sale day. They had traps set along the bottom paddock where they knew there was a warren. If they didn't go around the traps to check for any rabbits caught, the devils or the forest ravens would eat them first. So they were anxious to go out as soon as the sky cleared. They set aside their irritation with each other. Jack carried the setting stick to reset any traps that had been sprung. Rabbits were everywhere, so they were hopeful of finding a good haul. Their mother had her cooking pot ready and everyone at home could already taste the stew in their mouths. Both boys took their shotguns in case they saw a wallaby or caught some extra rabbits on the run. The brothers strode ahead through the bush following trails they knew well. They'd been along here plenty of times following a shortcut to the bottom paddock. On side tracks, bushy diversions were full of entangling branches. Clusters of native laurel and bat-winged ferns wound as tightly together as a ball of knitting wool, and sometimes a sudden opening in a glade of mossy tree roots, revealing a multitude of possible paths leading off to new green byways. The bush, moss-covered world of possibilities had been their home ground since they could first crawl outside the fence. Amos had always been the runt of the family. Jack didn't want to bring him along. He complained he was too small but their mother asked him to take the boy to let him help. Amos pumped his short legs over the furrows of the paddock as hard as he could go, a small wiry child. He yelled at his brothers to wait. Get up here then, said Eddie, and he paused. We better wait for the little blighter, he said to Jack. You wait then, I'll get on with it, said Jack. And he walked onto the first snares, not far ahead along the fence line. Eddie waited for his little brother. You gotta keep up if you wanna be a good rabbit oh, he said when Amos reached him, boots caked with sticky mud. I can skin them real good, said Amos. First, you gotta catch them, said Eddie. Farther on, Jack gave a cry as a trap snapped back. It missed his thumb, but came close enough to scare a shout out of him. A curse flowed into the morning air. Mind your bloody language, said Eddie, coming up to him. They both laughed, so Amos did too. The little boy looked down at the rabbit trap, now pulled open, set again for the next animal to cross it. The recent occupant lay beside Jack's boots, broken necked. Jack picked it up, took his knife out of his belt, cut a slit in one leg and threaded the opposite foot through it, making a loop. He tossed the dead rabbit to Amos. First one of the day, I hope there'll be plenty more for you to carry home to mother. Amos looped the rabbit onto the stick he carried and put it over his shoulder like a swag. How many you reckon we'll get, Jack, he asked. Not many at this rate if we stand around gas bagging, said Eddie. I don't reckon we'll get many in any case, said Jack. Trap's been set two days, should have checked them yesterday. The devils will have got some of them by now. But rabbits come out after a wet, said Eddie. I reckon the traps will be full. You want to look on the bright side, Jack. There won't be many, said Jack, his mouth in a stubborn line. The terrible weather had got him down, no doubt about that. They walked on to the next snare. The dead rabbit swayed on Amos's stick. I reckon we'll get at least 20, said Eddie. Yes, 20, said Amos. Lucky if it's half a dozen, said Jack. His hat drawn low on his forehead shaded his eyes. His chin was blue with a shadow of stubble. And half a dozen won't go far in the stew pot, he added. I can skin them for you, Jack, said young Amos. I can do it. Eddie laughed. You're a bit slow yet, Nipper. I reckon you'll need some help with the skinning. We're going to pick up heaps, remember? Well, we better split up, said Jack, or we'll never get any rabbit stew. The two older boys agreed to part and each took a different brown boundary with a different row of snares to check. They both had their shotguns ready. Wallabies rustled in the bush. They took no notice of Amos, who hesitated between following one big brother or the other. They remained within hailing distance and occasionally called across the wet chocolate paddock tufted with native grass. Soon, Eddie lifted his gun and fired at a scurry of rabbits he saw break from the long grass at the bottom of the paddock. 
Reckon I got a couple, he called to Jack. Jack looked up, squinting. He peered towards the warren, then back over his shoulder. Where's the little bloke? Ain't he with you? No, he ain't. Jack began to hurry towards Eddie, stumbling through the furrows and mud. The two brothers stared in the direction of the grassy bank where Eddie had fired, yelling, Amos, Amos. They ran towards the place. One dead rabbit lay on the muddy soil, warm and bleeding, limp as a wet rag. Amos, where's that kid? They heard a reedy snivelling then, winding up out of the scrub behind the bank like a tendril of smoke. They couldn't make out words, only an animal whine. For a minute, Jack wondered if one of the dogs had followed them to the traps. When they found their little brother, he had shot wounds in his shoulder and back. He'd fallen by a rabbit trap, in which there was a rabbit caught by its foot, alive but weak and panting. Jack leant down, took it out of the trap and wrung its neck with one quick movement. You silly little bugger, what are you doing in front of me shotgun, said Eddie, sweating and trembling. Bound to happen when you bring a nipper rabbiting, said Jack. Eddie looked a bit white, but Jack didn't think much harm was done. He'd had a sprinkle of shot in his own shoulder in the past and mother had dug it out and patched him up. He paused to join the dead rabbit's feet in a loop, then said they'd better get Amos home for mother to pick out the shot. Might be much bloody stew today, he added. When they lifted Amos, they saw blood starting to soak through his shirt. Eddie had to carry him slung over his shoulder. Jack said he'd keep on and clear the rest of the traps. This took him a couple of hours on his own and he tried a few shots as well. By the time he came back to the yard, he had three dozen rabbits slung on the stick across his shoulder, his coat slimy with rabbit blood. He carried his load to the side yard to do the skinning and found Eddie sitting on a log seat with his elbows on his knees, smoking a cigarette rolled from his tobacco pouch. A ringlet of thin smoke wound upwards and the acrid sweet aroma of burning tobacco stained the air. There you are, said Jack. How's the kid? You can help me skin this lot. I ended up getting a few. He heaved his load of rabbits onto the ground. Eddie grunted and took another suck of smoke from his cigarette. Reckon you could roll me one of those, said Jack, since I did all the work. Eddie looked up. The little bugger ain't too good, he said. Lord, Eddie, what do you mean? It were only a bit of shot. Mother will dig it out. Well, she has tried, and so has Granny, and old Biddy Clark is in there too. Looks like he bled a bit too much, maybe. Or a bit of shot hit something vital. Oh, he'll be all right, said Jack. He didn't understand Eddie's uneasiness. Mother would fix the kid up. They skinned the rabbits together. They were quick at it and silent. The job done, the skin stretched on wires and put in the shed for drying, the offal fed to the dogs, the meat chopped up for cooking. Only then they went together into the unnaturally quiet house. Thank you. I'm just recalling our discussions from uh, three years ago <laughs> when Annette started this. And I'm just sitting there thinking, yes, that's the novel you were talking about. That's the one, that's the story you were talking about. Um, it wasn't, it's very changed, but it's perfectly, you know, um, a perfect expression of the journey that you've been on. I, that's what it, I got from it. Beautiful. Um, Annette, we've got um, Bronwyn next, I think. Bronwyn Renex. Um, uh, Bronwyn and I have crossed paths um, at many of these uh, events for the last, well, the same, the, the last um, 1700 years. Um, and, uh, but I'll let uh, Bronwyn tell you about her project and to read. Bronwyn. Thanks, Julie. Um, so my name is Bronwyn. I, like Bastian said earlier, I, um, we both started doing a, um, a sort of private course with Beth Yap, like I can't remember how many years ago now, and then we both ended up um, coming here and doing our masters by research and Beth was my supervisor as well and was fabulous. Um, so I did it part time, so it took me four years, although the, for the first sort of one or something I didn't really do much work and Beth was a fabulous supervisor and I, I think I came because I knew what I wanted to do Well, I knew I had something inside that I wanted to get out but I needed a mentor and a guide and uh, I probably didn't take as much advantage of my peers as I could have because um, I was off doing other things often um, but it was really fantastic one of the great one of apart from having a great supervisor um, one of the courses, I, I audited a course, uh, which means you sort of go and you don't get any credit for it, you just join in. I don't know if, I think you're in that course, Annette, do you know what I'm going to say? Critical Context for Creative Writing, which 
blew my mind open with the uh, the texts that Fiona gave us and the ideas that were tossed around in that class and just supercharged my kind of brain that had been, bit, you know, a bit, uh, my brain muscle was a bit lax. So uh, I finished my master's, uh, I think at the end of 2020 uh, and graduated in 2021. Uh, and I am also gonna get a book published by Upswell Publishing. It's coming out in June this year. Um, so I'll read just a few short bits from it. Oh, it's about, uh, it's called Life with Birds. This is my little mock-up. And it's about sort of families and secrets and how we talk about war and birds and a whole lot of other things. Um, this is called Not Birds, But Crocodiles. I sat down wanting to write about birds this morning, but ending up, ended up going to the doctors instead to get a referral under the mental health plan. Thinking about dad and reading about veteran suicides had anger and sadness collecting like dust in the corners of my heart. I was waiting at the doctors reading about celebrity marriage breakups when my old neighbor, Alan, hobbled in and sat down by my side, not realizing it was me. When we were neighbors, Alan decided that the eucalypt at the front of my house needed trimming because it was getting close to the telegraph wires. He turned up at my front door one morning wearing only stubbies and thongs and holding a ladder. I'm gonna trim your tree, he told me. Oh, you don't need to, I said, as I followed him to the tree and started holding the ladder. He obviously wasn't asking permission. As he leant the ladder on the branch he was about to soar, I tried again. You don't need, really need to, Alan. Be careful. Are you sure this is a good idea? I looked up at him on the ladder and realized he was wearing nothing under his faded stubbies. Despite his age, his state of undress and his dubious skills, he was a force I couldn't reckon with. I could only stand at the foot of the ladder, hoping not to be the thing that broke his fall when the branch broke or, or he was electrocuted. When he was satisfied, Alan took his ladder and went home, leaving my front porch covered in leaves and branches. In the waiting room, I tapped him on the shoulder and said, fancy meeting you here. He commented on the increasing likelihood of meeting at the doctors as one aged, then started to tell me about his wedding. I got married, you know, really, why? to make sure my sister can't get anything when I'm gone. How long have you and Mario been together? 40 years. Alan was an aging and dissolute Hungarian with a home style haircut. Mario, a handsome and emotional Argentinian with soft brown eyes and a talent for sewing. They loved opera and German shepherds and gardening. Their dogs were always called macho. When their first macho died, they got a macho number two and so on. Macho three had such bad arthritis they needed to tend him night and day. They grew pennywort in their front garden to put in his food twice a day. Then each morning and evening, they lugged him around the neighborhood for a walk in a homemade sling. Despite not admitting to any romance about the wedding, Alan proceeded to tell me all about it. It was in a registry office. He was worried that the person conducting the ceremony would be judgmental about him and Mario, but it had been a woman and she'd been lovely. They'd had a few neighbours as guests. Mario, he said, leaked a few times. It took me a moment to work out he meant Mario had cried. She asked if we wanted rings and I said no, but then I pulled out a ring from my pocket for Mario, a little gold band with five little diamonds, one for each letter of his name, and then he leaked again. You old romantic, didn't he know that you were gonna do that? No, and then he started leaking. Alan then went on to tell me about the reception, which they had at their house. Alan cooked crocodile stew. Crocodile stew, why? It's delicious. Where would you even buy crocodile? Marrickville, next door to Banana Joe's. It's frozen. It's expensive, about $20 a kilo. He then went on to describe the whole process of cooking it so it tastes okay, at which point I zoned out. You lost me at crocodile, I'm afraid, Alan, but it's delicious, he said before continuing his monologue about the ideal times and temperatures for cook crocodile cooking. I was worried that when my doctor saw me smiling at Alan, she would think I wasn't depressed enough to warrant a referral. I didn't even feel like I could muster the tears to convince her otherwise. A what the fuck look. One Sunday, Adam and I visit his friend Gay at home. She's fighting cancer. Why do you always have to say fighting cancer and not coping with or moving through? 
She's going through rounds of chemo and various operations, and I sense during our visit that she doesn't necessarily want to talk about all her procedures. So I tell her about the birds that have set up home outside Adam's bedroom window. We'd been watching a Currawong family nest for weeks. From the very first day, the mother bird started settling, setting a few sticks together on a fork in the tree and pressing them into place with her breast. Must be so frustrating not having hands. Over the next week or so, the next nest took shape and then one day, the mother took up residence in it almost full time. We figured she must have laid her eggs. Adam was pretty down at that point, tired and stressed and reading about trauma all the time for his work as a psychologist had taken its toll. He saw the nest as depressing. Something was bound to go wrong. It was bound to fall out of the tree or cuckoos would come and kill the chicks or the egg eggs just wouldn't hatch. Despite his fears, days passed and everyone survived. We watched as the dad bird brought worms to the mum and popped them in her mouth or they'd both fly off to find food. Most often though, she sat and he fed her. We became a bit obsessed, bird obsessed, Googling things about them while lying in bed and talking about them when we were out. Do birds have knees? Why don't birds fly everywhere? Why do they walk sometimes? I'd fly everywhere if I was a bird. They look so funny when they walk. We stood laughing at a flat-footed seagull walking on the ground. You can fly, you know, I told it, as it ran past us on its red clown feet. How long does it take for eggs to hatch? Adam had been reading about them, about how birds can lay eggs over time and how only once they're all laid will they fertilise them. We talked about chicken eggs. They're basically chicken, period, he said. Oh, God, I don't know if I'll ever be able to eat them again. We watched days later as tiny, bald, baked bean heads, all beak and bulging blind eyes, popped up over the edge of the nest when the parents went to get worms. We worried when it got windy or rainy. I'd text Adam to ask him how the babies were. We watched the hungriest baby on the right grow biggest and fastest. We saw the mother bird sit higher and higher in her nest until she skirted the top of it, her three big babies squashed underneath. One morning, Adam's cat Bowser snuck into the room and got up on the bed. The mother bird noticed, and once I'd shooed him out and shut the door, she landed on the balcony wall and gave me what I understood as a what the fuck look. We noticed their strange little bird rituals and wondered in turn if they noticed our human ones. We imagined them watching us having sex and saying to each other, what do you think they are doing? After finishing my bird rave, Gay told us about her neighbors, one of whom was a doctor. They found an ibis with a broken wing and the doc, doc operated on it to fix it. When the neighbors were about to go on holiday, they didn't know what to do with the bird, so they took it with them. The two of them and an ibis with a sling off to the coast. <laughs> It is so wonderful actually to see everything develop. I do feel like I've seen that develop over this time. Uh, I know it wasn't the same sort of um, material, there was the, the themes were there and, you know, and of course, if I was a bird, I would fly everywhere too is my motto. <laughs> um, Lachlan, we've got, um, sorry, I need my glasses. We've got Lachlan McGregor coming next. Um, and again, um, I don't think I've seen uh, Lachlan at a reading, have I? Not to dip, no, we haven't crossed paths. Um, and so, um, what ha will happen is he'll come around and I'll scoot out of the frame and he'll tell us a little bit about himself and then he'll read and then I'll be back to um, take you through something else. So, here's Lachlan McGregor. Thanks, Bronwyn. Um, so, though I'm doing the masters as well part time, I've got one more year to go. Um, yeah, I also want to mention a couple of things that I really have learned over the course of the masters. Um, I want to echo what Annette and Kate said about the, the wonderful readings you're exposed to. They're all just so fantastic. And sometimes you luck out and you're doing a, you're writing about a subject that the, um, your tutor, um, that happened to be Vanessa Berry is also writing about at the same semester. So all the readings just perfectly align with your, your creative research. So, um, and another thing I want to say is I've been exposed and I've actually tried, given, been given the opportunity to try so many types of writing. Um, every semester and every subject gives you the option of a creative project as well as maybe an essay or a critical essay or 
Um, so you've always got the opportunity to try new styles of writing. And I've, I've written memoir, short story, the start of a novel, some poetry, writing in fragments. Um, and so I think that's one of the great strengths of this course. You can really explore your writing. I started at thinking I'd just write short stories, but it's really, really evolved. Um, I'm just gonna read a couple of short stories from um, a project I submitted for critical contexts in creative writing. It's just a piece of climate fiction and it's about some, it's about our interactions with animals as they go extinct and um, what it would be like to encounter an extinct animal or the last of its kind and sort of set in the future. So I'm gonna read two and I think they'll squeeze into the eight minutes, hopefully. Um, so Gouldy and Finch, Erythrua Gouldier. The sun poked its rays around Emma's bedroom walls. She groaned, pushing her face into the pillow. The top of her head felt like it was about to crack open, like the bright gap between her blind and the windowsill. Her throat bubbled with acids from the Sauv Blanc the night before. After showering and chugging some painkillers with a mouthful of orange juice and wine, Emma sank into the couch. She grabbed the wraparound goggles that were sitting haphazardly on the coffee table, almost like swimming goggles, but chunkier. Next to them was a pair of gray and plastic elastic gloves, which she slid her hands into. Each had a small hard plastic layer on the back of the hand with anagram tech written in red. Emma grabbed her phone and scrolled, landing on a picture of a European short hair sitting gracefully with a docile smile. She hit select, pressed a button on her goggles and immediately her vision went fuzzy. She could see her room around her, but there was now a cat rubbing against the chair. Emma gasped. It didn't matter how many times she did it, it always shocked her to see her old cat. Davy, Emma said in a high voice. He came over to her, sitting on the floor at her feet. She patted him, silky warmth pressed against her fingers, the sensory pads of her gloves sinking with the image, mocking the feel of David's fur. Oh, Davy, 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 she doted the way she used to. She rubbed her fingertips under the right side of his jaw, which she always loved. Ah, David flickered and disappeared. Her phone was ringing. Martin appeared on the screen. Hey, you, you okay? Sue said she didn't see you at the sheds this morning. Emma groaned, remembering. Did you feed the girls? I may have uh, slept in again. Sue ain't gonna be happy. They can go months without food, Mart. They're tough bastards. Why do you think they're still with us? Martin paused. It's not the camels I'm worried about, Em. Emma sighed, hanging up. As much as she loved working with the camels, their dorkiness, their unrequited friendliness, their remarkable physiologies. It was the tourists she hated. Emma was never that fond of humans per se, but tourists drove her to drink a bottle of wine a night. The fact that camels were the last known living land mammal in Australia drove up their popularity. It sent rich idiots from far and wide itching to ride one of these elegant be beings down a stretch of beast, sorry, a stretch of beach just as rare considering the rising sea levels. And having to entertain these people was the last straw. She thought about her old job as a wildlife conservationist a lot. Back when she'd guided efforts to save rare birds at Mornington Marion Down Sanctuary, she'd had a sense of purpose. Now all she felt day in, day out, especially since the last birds had died in captivity was hopelessness. She got up and sat on the balcony, which was above a red paddock with a couple of white gums. She lit a cigarette and stared out into the earthy abyss of the Kimberley. A flicker of colors crossed her view. She leant up, blinking, thinking of how migraines can blur vision another flash of colors. Then the colors stopped, mid-flash on the railing. Emma caught herself before she fainted. A brightly colored bird was sitting on her rust balcony railing, a meter along from where she stood. Moss green on the back and wings, a yellow belly, purple chest and crimson face in perfect segments. A sturdy pyramid-shaped beak dipped in red, stuck out horizontally in Emma's direction. She pulled off her goggles, painfully tangled in her hair, but the bird was still there clearer than any hologram she loaded. It was there. Fuck. Her mind raced with different options. Was this real? If so, did she call someone? One of her old colleagues, maybe. Or did she try to catch it with an old fishing net somewhere in her garage? But as quickly as it arrived, had arrived, like the death of a rainbow, the finch left, darting towards the closer white gum. Emma ran like a mad creature, thudding down the steps across the sea of dirt, up to the tree, but there was no bright color in those branches, just the silvery green of the canopy. Up above, she could see a hollow. Gordian finches were the only grass finches to nest exclusively in tree hollows, she recalled. She climbed up, grazing skin, 
heaving herself up branches and looked in the hollow. It was bare, but for a solitary yellow feather. Was it an old feather or was it from the bird she just chased dreamlike across the paddock? It had definitely flown there to this tree, she was sure. She came to, steadying herself on the branch. Or had she imagined it? It had been infinitely more vivid, more beautiful than any image a tech company could muster. And she'd been given one last look at it. And I'll just read the next one and it's definitely shorter. So this is whale shark, Rincodon typus. Newman kept the nets on a stone slab. Beneath it was once an elaborate gate to a pura, a Balinese temple, all underwater now except for this red rectangle of rock. This one, at one time, this Pudrak Sana marked the threshold to the inner sanctum of the temple, the temple where his Kakek grandfather lay, but today it was just another point in the vast continuum of ocean. And the ocean was what lay ahead of him, dark blue stretching to an eternal sky. The heat was biting. Newman waved some cloth through the water and wrapped it around his head. The dripping fingers of salty water cooled him for a few moments. Once he felt he was far enough, he let the net fall, sinking downwards into the dark green, probably above some rice fields. His kakek used to tell him he would find the spot by the number of gulls that hovered. But since there were none anymore, Nierman listened to a voice in his head. It was his grandfather's voice for sure, taunting him from beneath the waves where he was buried. Nierman gazed downwards, that itching hope of seeing dark shadows move. His father still laughed at him whenever he took the boat out. There had been no fish for half a century since the seas around the tropics had warmed so much the nutrients turned bad. Still, that voice spoke to him from the depths. As he fed the rope, it went taut. It was a lifelike jerk, not a dull pull from being caught on something. Then it went still again. Newman knew that his fool's hope, what his fool's hope could do to his senses. But as he looked in the water, the floor of the ocean rose and shifted just a few feet below his boat. Islands of white, hundreds of them, drifted against, drifted against the deep space like stars, each one its own planet. Newman leapt, leapt on the side, transfixed. He'd never seen a galaxy move before. The boat rocked as the ocean floor rose next to him, skimming beneath the water's surface like it was wrapped in a transparent film. A dark, tall fin rose from the water, gliding slowly, gently. Newman stayed steady. He knew what this was, the largest fish in the world. The planetary pattern on its membranous skin was unique, as unique to this fish as Newman's fingerprint was to him, but Newman's skin couldn't blend with his surroundings. The Jabal shark continued to glide up and around Newman's little boat like a boulder against a pebble, and then it sank, suddenly gone from Newman's view. He leapt, leapt to the other side of the boat, but no dark shape moved on that side either. So he dived into the water, struggling downwards, trying to glide gracefully like the behemoth that had just visited him. The salt bit his eyes, but he kept them open, searching madly. It had vanished as quickly as it had emerged from its distant realm. Newman just wanted to join there, wherever there was. It was magic, complex, infinite life. His lungs pushed against his chest. He had to make a choice. Newman clambered back onto his boat and lay face up. What is this trick now, Kakek? He shouted to the emptiness of the sea. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks Lachlan. So I think we can all agree that critical contexts is the go. That's the one you should all be chasing um, when you start to um, uh, get together your uh, enrollment and your, your schedule. So this is my advice to everybody from every level, even if you're an undergraduate, uh, a postgrad or doing masters or even your PhD, um, some of us have to do classes, get your overall plan going and choose, um, uh, have some idea of what type of writing you want to do and choose your units that are going to feed into that writing and constantly iterate the writing. Uh, keep feeding the same sort of ideas in there, you know, um, like keep telling the same story and do it in different ways. Um, the way that um, with, with all the different techniques that you're being introduced to. So, that's it for our readers. I'm sort of doing this on behalf of the recording. So I'm being very um, uh, official here. So on behalf of me and uh, everybody who's reading, thank you very much for listening to that. We're going to now move into, um, at whatever time it is now, we're going to move into a little bit of a workshop thing. It's much more relaxed. Um, just take it easy. I'm just going to see who's here because I think people have kind of um, uh, left us. So just, uh, just take a moment and just watch me fluffing around a little bit here. 
Um, so it's really just because everybody here has been Bronwyn Rennex talking. Have you noticed that in, in the side there? So every time we get up uh, talking has been Bronwyn. So um, that's been Bronwyn doing impersonations of us all afternoon. Um, but now, Sarah, are you, are you here? Can you put your, um, your uh, video on and say hi? Um, Sarah, are you there? Because the other... Hi. Hi. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. I'm on my phone. It's a little bit temperamental, so that's why I've got myself switched off. Right. So, so you're, yeah. here, you're not on campus here? No, I'm not on campus. Oh, what a shame. I know. Um, and so what, do you, what have you um, uh, enrolled in? I'm on my um, little semester hiatus at the moment, um, but I felt a little bit um, already, I'm already missing uni a little bit. So I've just come to um, come to this, but I've taken a semester off. So I won't be actually coming. Um, oh yeah, no, that's right. So yeah. I just wanted to know where to pitch this. Um, this I'm, that we're gonna oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> um, I'm undergrad. Do you want to do you want to jump in and and do the exercise with me? Yeah, you do. Um, uh, so um, let me just do um, share the screen. Um, see what I mean about Zoom meetings? Like just there was in MasterChef there was a a, a couple, a, a mother and son um, who was there one one year and and um, he was very warm to her. But it seemed like the producers kept saying, "And so, like Maria, what are you doing now?" Um, so don't tell us, like, like tell, tell Josh, tell your son. And so she was constantly going, well, Josh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move over here. And so every time I do something like that and I say, well, Josh, I'm coming over here to do this and turn my thing off there. Um, okay, well, Josh, what we've got now My, this is my nightmare. Hello, hello. All right, great. Um, okay, welcome to my um, microscopic microscopic reading. <laughs> okay, you can't see me. Please don't let this be awful. Okay. It's called Microscopic Reading and Radical Rewording, everybody. Welcome. Um, welcome, Sarah, Patrice, Lachlan, Annette, Bronwyn, and Belinda. Um, so this is really um, something that I do for my, un my undergraduate un unit. Um, and it's kind of uh, like it's a bit strange. So I hope you're up for a bit of strangeness right now. So this is a method um, that analyzes text. Um, and you know, you're probably going, I've done enough, I'm about to graduate, I don't want to analyze any more text. Julie, stop it, it sounds horrible. Uh, but this is sort of the slow, um, deep uh, analyzing where we pull text apart and we mess with it. So we aim to misbehave and we, we, we get in to see how the words actually work. Um, uh, and what they're about and we're going and then we add to the words then we do a bit of rewording and then finally by the last iteration we've suddenly got something that is some sort of expression of our own response to the text from the very beginning um, so I'll show you where this um, idea came from <laughs> okay so this strategy is a mashup of ideas around writing through reading, through writing, through reading, through writing, through reading. So it's an iterative project, an iterative process. Um, and it's mashing up ideas from Francine Prose. Um, can somebody keep an eye on me? I don't really want to go over four o'clock. So somebody just keep an eye on the time for me. Um, so Francine Prose, when you do your introduction to creative writing in semester two, um, Patrice, which I hope you'll um, you'll enroll in and you may get into my tutorial. Um, you'll see uh, by about week seven, a, an essay by Francine Prose, who talks about word by word analysis as the best way of um, uh, you, you teach, you, you, you get taught 
um, it teaches the reader how to write by this kind of word by word, really slow, really deliberate kind of analysis. Um, and then another big influence was this poem here by Lynn Hedginian and Jack Collum in their book, Situation Sings. So this piece is called Wicker, uh, in which they take morsels of text, so little quotes, and this is something to do with my own research. I'm researching a commonplace book in the um, in Fisher Library. It's an 18th century book, and a commonplace book is something where you take quotes from your reading and you compile them into one personal book for the um, uh, for the activity of churning over the material, thinking through it, and so that you've got it to hand when you have a maybe a little debate or you're at a soiree, you want to bring up something that Seneca said, some bon mot, and it's something that you have um, churned over and you've absorbed and it just comes out naturally as if it's something that you say. And so it's got something also to do with citation because we can't possibly repeat something that somebody says and call it our own these days. Uh, I'm going to campaign to change that. I just want us all to have text if it's out in the world, then it's anybody's. Um, so they've taken these stanzas from anybody. You can see Walt Whitman, uh, US Grant. Um, you can see Ralph uh, Ellison, Christopher Marlowe. Um, who else have we got? Karen Blixen, I love the Karen Blixen one. I'm not sure, does anybody speak Danish? Is that Danish or is she uh, copying something that somebody said she was in Kenya, wasn't she? So I don't know whether what that is. So what is happening here is that they've um, made these into stanzas that look very like poems. Um, they've done a lot of lovely little lineation here. And then in this row here, they've responded to the original. And I imagine also in conversation with each other, but very much in conversation with the original quote. So that's really the basis of my exercise here. Um, and then there's also another influence and it's, and it's Bart um, and his analysis of um, an 18th century um, uh, novel, Saracene, uh, that he's done as an essay. Uh, in a book called SZ, we call it, and I think, and actually I think I've asked Annette this, I think it might have been in critical context actually, where we talked about SZ, Bart's book, and then somebody, and I thought it might have been you, said, I think it's SZ, and now that I think about it, I think it might have been Lucy, who was in French, who was in fact French. So S forward slash Z is Bart's book, uh, which you could say is SZ, which is essay. So it's actually an essay book um, where he actually demolishes the book by um, exploding apart uh, phrases and analyzes them uh, the way that he reads it or the way that it can be read. So it's not necessarily about the intention of the author. So you're not really looking for their original meaning. You're looking at how the text itself can be read. What is, what is it doing? Um, what are the patterns in text and um, very like his essay, um, which is Birth of the Reader, which um, is often called Death of the Author. Uh, so what I do is I go in class, we go to collaborative document, Google Doc. And here I've put the quotes from, or the, the work from Joan Didion. And this is from the excerpt from Why I Write. So this is a, a piece that Patrice you'll find um, in week one of Intro to Writing. You're asked to read that and you're asked to read George Orwell's Why I Write, uh, from which she stole not only the title, but also much else in it as well. Um, so by which I mean not a good writer or a bad writer, but simply a writer. What we do then is the microscopic reading and rewording, and we use as many of the digital online tools as available to us. And so what you can do is um, click on, click on good, look, explore bad. I can't get rid of this 
I'm over here, explore bad. And what you come up with is, of course, Michael Jackson's bad. So in a sense, what it does is this sort of tool is like feeding you your culture. You already know, you've got it in the back of your mind, bad, I'm bad. Um, I prefer, of course, though, to go to the definition and that's what I would prefer everybody to do. Um, uh, the other point actually about the Google Docs is that it never takes you directly to a definition or a thesaurus. It always does this kind of strange, here's the top thing that we would like you to look at. So yes, bad comes up in Google Docs, but if you do it on your own computer, it's much better to um, uh, for going straight to the thesaurus. Now, this is what somebody has done here. This is whoever was number one said, went just straight to the definitions, good, uh, so as to be desired or approved. Um, this I thought was wonderful because uh, it brings up this idea of um, approval, to be approved as a good writer who is doing the approving, to be a desirable person or to be desired to, uh, you know, who, who is doing the desiring, is the writer doing the desiring, is the reader doing the desiring, is the writer writing for the desire of the reader and all that can just come out of this little moment of pick, picking apart Joan Didion saying by which I mean not a good writer because what happens is in that word good when you explode it apart it becomes this kind of um, you know a, a thing of constellations it has uh, good the word good itself has got an etymological history it's traveled across geographies, it's jumped across the internet. Um, and so you're starting to look at the words as they exist on the page. All right, so that's what we do. Um, who else have we got here? Oh, hello, we've got a new person. Oh no, we're gone. <laughs> um, right, so what I was going to do, when we, when we had 26 people uh, enrolled in, in Zoom, we would all get on to this, um, this page here and do that. Now look, Sarah, it might be, am I saying it, Sarah? Um, it, yes, Sarah, uh, it might be very lonely for you if you go here now, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sh share the link with you in the chat and you can go there and just play around in it. Those, um, those, where am I? Those panels that have already been used, um, there's the link there in the chat if you want to go there. Those panels that have already been used, they were from uh, the class last year. So um, what's happened is here, this first person, I'm just, Making the screen bigger, Josh. All right, so what I've said. So this person here homed in on the binary of good and bad as value words. So that's come from the, uh, the definition. What sort of writer is desired by whom, etc. That's what I've just said. So even at this early stage, you start getting questions that are anchored in the original. So, I mean, that's the key to this, um, this strategy or this technique, and I mean, it's, just, it's a strategy, it's a method, is that it's, it keeps it anchored, it keeps your response um, really anchored in the original text. But this is my favorite piece here. So somebody then went on, um, Joan Didion's piece was, I would never have become a writer had I been blessed. And we've cut that off rather sharply, but I love the, um, the effect of that. Then somebody's come along and said, uh, I, individual, would, would, or would not. Never unbecoming, which is a very nice uh, twist on the word, never would have become, you unbecome, well, that's very nice. And then the next person said, I could not, I thought for a while it might have been profess to be a scribe amongst this curse, very romantic. And then somebody in the third column came and reworked everything and they said, this is the most beautiful phrase I've ever come across actually I never would have chosen a life choosing words had the world gifted me words which fulfilled me now I don't know who wrote that um, because this is a collaborative uh, document 
And anything here is actually the um, sort of, I suppose, the intellectual property of the group as a whole. So we don't actually put names to it in the, um, the tradition of, a, of the commonplace book, which is about collecting quotes and reforming quotes and subsuming quotes and turning them into your own beautiful nectar. Um, so you've, so that's there. I'm just actually going through that for the recording to say this is, I don't know if you could actually get this um, link up here. No, you can't get that link up here. So anybody who's looking at this later, I'm sorry, you can't have that link. But what I can recommend you do is um, uh, come and enroll in Introduction to Creative Writing. Uh, and we'll go over um, that a little bit. Um, so that's that for now. What I might do, because because we're, um, we're really, um, Sarah, what I might do is finishing up now. And um, I hope you got that link and you can go and explore, um, you can go and explore that um, document. And um, hopefully we'll see you back here after your, what did you call it? A, uh, a semester hiatus. <laughs> a semester hiatus. Um, yeah. So um, you know, I hope we see you at the at um, the events that are held and keep your hand in. Make sure that you keep in contact with us all, so that when you finally come back, uh, are you thinking of doing it in second semester? Yes, at this stage. Great. So when you finally come back, you can just walk up to me and say, Julie, I'm Sarah. I was in that uh, workshop with you, and now I'd like to collaborate with you on a new document, just you and I together, and we'll write our book. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank right. you very much. No, oh, you're welcome. I'm going to finish up here. And then what we're going to do is just do a little bit of cut and paste and um, do some work for Patrice here. Okay, thanks, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording now.